Thanks, Jim. Um, thanks to all the conference organisers. It's a fabulous workshop. I love coming here. Um, and thanks all for attending. So, I'm Keith McIntosh, the CEO of PV Lighthouse. And at PV Lighthouse, we make R&D software for the PV industry. And one of our products is called SunSolve Yield. That is yield software. And what distinguishes it from many other programs is it has a lot of advanced uh, models in it. Um, how important are those advanced models? Well, that really depends on how much, how different they predict the yield to, to more conventional models. And so that's what this talks about, um, quantifying those differences between the advanced and conventional models. I'm going to go through a lot of slides. Um, so just a reminder that all of these slides will be up on the PVPMC website and you can go through it more leisurely. Uh, sorry, that button's not working. I'll try it. Yeah, I've tried that one. Side, tried side. Um, one of these. I think it's, it's connected to this. Oh, maybe here. Can you just do that? Yeah, yeah okay. Exactly. Um, so yeah, the objective of this talk is to quantify the differences between um, the models, advanced and conventional, for eight different mechanisms, eight different aspects of yield solving. Um, we'll test practically everything with SunSolve Yield, where you can switch between models, um, but not for the view factor. For the view factor, we'll use the, the model within PVSYST. Um, we'll look at three different system configurations, and we'll just look at one site just down the road in Utah. Um, this is a preview of the results, and a spoiler, these are the results um, for the SATs. Um, but to give you an idea of, of how we're going to compare the different uh, models. So as you can see above the line, there's eight different mechanisms we're looking at. Um, and we're plotting the MBE, the mean bias error. So that's the relative difference in the annual yield that's being predicted as you switch between the conventional and the advanced model. Um, any number that's greater than zero means that the conventional model is predicting a higher yield than the advanced model. And then we're also going to combine everything together, just run all the, the conventionals, that's the equivalent of running PVSYST, and comparing it to when we apply every advanced model. That's at the bottom. Now because models are convoluted, for example, the thermal model relies on the optical model, that means that just adding up the MBEs for each of the individual mechanisms won't give us the, the final result at the end. But it does give us an idea of the relative importance of the different advanced models that we're looking at. Um, an MBE of zero also doesn't mean that the, the models are identical. There's compensation that happens. So for example, a conventional model that might predict a lower yield in the morning might predict a higher yield at noon and those may cancel to give the same MBE or a, a close to zero. The same can be true for seasons. Summer may give lower than winter and, and they may compensate. And also there's sub-models within the models and, and maybe they um, could compensate. So as well as the MBE, we'll look at the CRMSE. That's the centred root mean square error. And in many ways, this is a better representation of the differences because we're looking at, it's, what, it's like the, the scatter between models or the standard deviation of all of the hours throughout the year and how um, similar the models are so th through all hours of the day and the year. So the higher that value, the more different the models are, the more different the advanced from the conventional. And you can see already the spoiler is that the system optics dominates there. So that's the difference between ray tracing and view factor. So at this point, or this, this um, talk isn't going to be talking about the accuracy of the models, just the differences between them. And the bigger the difference, the more concerning or the more research should be dedicated to understanding the reasons for those differences. Um, the results will be specific to the examples that I'll give and we would get different results at different locations, different weather, different configurations. Um, so just consider these results as a guide as to which sort of mechanisms and which uh, models um, you might be more interested in. Um, the CRMACs doesn't change too much from location to location but the MBEs do change a lot. And oh, I'll go back to this one. There we go. Um, so by themselves, we're not promoting one model over another one, and that's because it's not just about accuracy and precision and uncertainty that we, we compare models, but also on how easy they're implemented 
um, determining inputs and also how accepted they are by industry. You also have um, different objectives with modelling. You may be interested more in the morning or more on seasonal differences or you may just be interested in, in the annual yield. And so whether it's worth applying an advanced model depends on, on your objective as well. So the details are we're going to do these simulations at a site in Utah, southwest. We're not going to replicate this site, we're just using it for the weather. That's Solcast data, TMY data. It's a good solar resource, it's low cloud, it's cold in winter, it's warm in summer. Um, we're interested in the atmospheric effects too because that changes the spectrum. Um, and so this site is a relatively dry site and it's dusty. So that turbidity is, is much higher than what the value that's used in the AM 1.5G spectrum. And that's one of the key differences in the spectral results. The pressure is much lower because of the altitude, but that has very little impact on, on the spectrum. Um, we're going to look at three different um, configurations. So there's the SATs. You can see the results of ray tracing here for, for one time during the year. And um, as you can see, the, we're taking into account the torque tube, the posts, uh, the frames of the modules, the, the rails or the clamps. And in these results, we're looking at the insulation on, on every solar cell. Um, so you can see you get interesting um, features on the rear. And then we've also got the fixed, um, which takes into account the purlins and rafters and the posts. And we're also looking at waves, or also called domes in PVCIST or, or Mavericks in Australia. And what's interesting about this plot is the ray tracing shows that some light gets in between the, the bays of modules and reflects up underneath and you can see some extra light hitting the rear of these bifacial panels. That amounts to about a 1% gain. Um, even though they're that close to the ground, there's still a significant gain, which um, at least at the moment in PVCIS, that's, that's not included. So that'll lead to about a 1% difference between models. And we're looking at Longi modern modules, 144 cells, 21.3%. So some pretty good modules. Um, we'll look at infinitely large systems. So that, what that amounts to is that we're looking at the central modules of a large field. So we're, we're ignoring edge effects around the perimeters, but not the edge effects around the bays of modules. You can see from the ray tracing that we're taking into account those. Um, we'll just look at the DC, up to the DC module output. So all of the advanced models uh, are implemented up to that stage. And we'll, we'll take one hourly time step so we can go lower than that. Um, now let's run through those models. So there's eight of them. And we're going through in, in the, the importance, at least for this site. So as we go through each model, the CRMSC gets bigger and bigger and the, and the relevance of the advanced model becomes greater. So it's conventional con to, con to assume an albedo that's constant with wavelength. Um, in the advanced case, we can take into account wavelength dependence. We've chosen a relatively high albedo here just to, to emphasize any differences. Um, for electrical mismatch, it's assumed that that's constant throughout the year. With ray tracing, we can calculate instead the current in every cell, and then when we solve the SPICE model for, um, for that module, that's taking into account the current in every single cell in the module and the bypass diodes, we can calculate the electrical mismatch at every point throughout the year. So that's what we do in the advanced case. For the solar position, um, we just take the the models, the standard ones in PVCIST. Um, but there is, there's plenty of other uh, models and one is extremely uh, long and painful to implement. But we did that and that one is reputed to be accurate to within 0 0.0003 degrees for 8,000 years and we implemented that. Um, and you can see that the difference between the two is about plus or minus 0.3 degrees in the zenith and plus or minus 0.6 for the, for the azimuth. So that's pretty small. But we're curious, so let's find out what difference that makes to the, to the yield. Um, the diffuse sky distribution, it's standard to use the Perez model, uh, the 1990 model. Um, and in, in the way that it's implemented in PVCIST is the different to the way that we implemented the same model in SunSolve. And I'll explain that the difference is in a moment. Um, but also you might be interested in the Hay Davies model. And so I've got the results for that for the annual yield for this site. And it's about a 1.5% difference between Hay Davies and, and Perez. It's a, it's a really big deal. It's, it's something we'd like to understand. But in the implementation that we've done there, it's actually much more similar. Um, so it's closer to 0.2%. And 
Um, so, so really what that's saying is there's a big difference in the, in the implementation of the Perez models between the two programs and, and that's really uh, a great area of research. So the Perez model, it takes the, the sky, the, the irradiance throughout the sky and it condenses it into three sources, the isotropic, the circumsolar and the horizontal, the uh, horizon brightening. And then you calculate what irradiance or, or what intensity that is on a tilted module. And in PV cysts, the, the horizontal brightening, um, oh, so what, you do that first, then you calculate the shading from, from the modules. And in PV cysts, the horizontal shading is considered to be the same as the isotropic, at least in, in the current versions. Um, when we implemented it in SunSolf, we assumed that all of the horizontal light is being blocked by the, the edged modules. So the horizontal light that reaches the central modules is, is zero. And that's the reason for the, for the big difference between the two programs. You'll see that amounts to, to more than a 1% difference in yield. Um, okay, the module optics, it's standard to, to assume that it's just a very simple block, that it's uniform throughout. Um, and after taking into account the IAM, you, you just absorb all, all the radiance. Um, whereas in the advanced case, we, we, some, we ray trace, so we count for the properties of the module, the dimensions, the, um, the optical properties, the thicknesses, the the shape of the, the texture and so on. So when we ray trace that entire module within the field, it takes about 10 times longer. Um, so a full ray trace for the year is about a 10 minute exercise when we account for, for all of that with inside the module. And it's about a one minute. So we, we ray trace a year in, in one minute um, if we just take the simple case. Um, the main real difference is the frames. So ray tracing the frames leads to shading at different times of the day for the, for the rear side illumination. Um, but then there's also wavelength dependencies. Um, that's probably the, other, the big difference. Now I'd just like to mention one aspect of the, the conventional model um, that was brought up yesterday in, in several talks, and that is that the IAM in many pan files is unrealistic. And that turned out to be the case in this project. We loaded the pan file for the Longi module, and you can see the black and white line. It's, is very different and entirely unrealistic compared to the yellow line, which is the line calculated by um, PVSYST. And PVSYST now give a warning when you give a, when you, you load a, um, a silly IAM, just like that. And so we calculated the difference in the yield, and it was a one and a half percent difference in yield if you use the unrealistic loaded pan file compared to the one that was calculated um, with a Fresnel AR coding. So that's a big difference, and we didn't want to um, treat the conventional approach with that black and white line. So we've just used the, the yellow one, which is very similar to what you get in ray tracing when you account for all the wavelengths and the, uh, the AR coding. The thermal model, standard to use the Feynman model with, with conventional inputs. In the advanced case, we developed a, a thermal model and published that last year um, at the conference, but there's many other thermal models. And this one accounts for radiative losses, how that changes through the day, um, transient effects, tilt dependence, and it's fitted to experimental data. So you can see in this work we did with FTC last year that we could predict the, the temperature of the model module much more accurately with, with the more advanced model. Um, and we've got a similar one that we've done for waves in a project with um, 5B and Sun Cable. Um, the solar spectra, it's conventional to use the AIM-1.5G spectrum, or to effectively assume that. Um, in the advanced case, we calculate the spectrum at every hour of the year, both for direct and diffuse, depending on atmospheric conditions. And you can see these are the three main influences on spectrum. The air mass, the precipital water vapour, and the turbidity. And remembering that this site was a dry site and a dusty one, and so that's the reason that this site has a, has a larger difference to uh, the AIM-1.5G than many others. We've looked at sites where the MBE is practically the same between them, but the scatter doesn't it varies really throughout the day and year, so still spectral differences are, are generally, we consider them as important. And finally, the biggest difference between conventional and advanced is, in conventional, is, is view factors, and then you modify those with bifacial loss factors, like the structural shading and the transmission. In ray tracing, we don't need to do that because we're, we're ray tracing the whole scene, we're taking into account the, the, the rear side structure, the spacing between modules and bays. Um, so we determined the, those values with ray tracing just to, um, I mean, what value to put in for structural shading. Everyone uses different values or defaults, but 
we decided to use the values that would give the closest um, different, uh, sorry, the closest approximation of what's going to happen in the ray tracing. But they're constant throughout the year in the conventional one, when in reality they change depending on the time of day. Um, we've validated the ray tracing to some extent. So this is with a project again with FTC where we compared results to polynomial data. You can see a good agreement for the front illumination and for the real illumination. Being able to, to mimic a lot of the small scale structure that was occurring at that site. Okay, so we're just gonna look at, at one slide in, in detail here. And this is the case where we're combining all conventional models. So it's effectively of running PVSYST and comparing it to all of the advanced models. And on this slide, we're plotting the relative difference in power at every hour of the year. Every dot is representing a comparison. And we can see that the biggest differences are occurring when the sun is low in the sky, when that zenith angle is high. And it's enormous, the difference is up to like 100%. But those differences, you know, there's not much uh, power coming out then, so it's also useful, or more useful, to plot the absolute difference in power at every time of the year. And coincidentally for this site, it actually stays kind of constant throughout the, well, independently of, of where the position of the sun is in the sky. But that's just a coincidence because all of those sub-models are balancing one another and, and leading to that. It doesn't always work out that way. Um, we also plot it against diffuse fraction and you can see that the conventional models um, lead to a higher estimate of the yield when there's not much cloud and a lower when there's more cloud. So there's dependencies on zenith angle and diffuse fraction. But all up, we're looking at almost a 2% difference in the annual yield, that's the MBE. And I'll put the CRMSE into context uh, in a moment. Um, over the course of the day, we see that the conventional models predict a higher yield in the morning and the afternoon. Roughly the same on average when the, the modules are flat, but there's still a lot of scatter at all times of day. And now I'm just going to flick through quickly through each of the, the different scatter just to give you a feeling for the results and how these dependencies on zenith and diffuse angle changes all depending on the model. So each of the advanced models are, um, are influencing these results um, differently. So um, there's those eight. And now to sum up, these are the those same results you saw at the beginning. The biggest differences um, we found was for the implementation of the Perez model, that was over a percent. Um, the thermal model was, was minus a percent in the yield. The, the module ray tracing was about half a percent. Um, the solar spectrum and the, and the optics were both over one percent in the other direction. And all up we saw a two percent difference in, in annual yield. Um, when looking at the CRMSC, the, the one again to, to emphasize the dominant effect is the choice of ray tracing or view factor. But there's still a relatively high CRMSC for, for a few other things. Um, when we looked at the fixed wave and the waves configuration, we see sort of similar results most of the way through. But I'll just draw your attention to the MBE of the system optics. That was quite different depending on whether we were looking at sats, fixed or waves. Um, in fact, the waves was a, over a minus 1% difference in, in actually close to 2% difference in yield as well, um, once we took into account everything. Um, but in all cases, the dominant effect was, was whether we used ray tracing or view factor. Um, so to, to conclude, we've got an example in, um, in southwest Utah. The larger sources of difference were from the system optics using ray tracing or view factor, um, but also significant differences in the spec solar spectrum, the thermal models, module optics, and diffuse sky distribution, or at least the implementation of the Perez model. And when we combined all of the conventional models and we looked at all the advanced models, we saw MBE differences of, of up to plus or minus 2%. Now, to put that CRMSC in context, if you double it, you get the 95% confidence interval. So really it's about, what we're saying is that the models are the same to within plus or minus 18 watts per module at any time during the year with 95% confidence. And if we divide that by the average module uh, power throughout the year in daytime, we're looking at differences of plus or minus about 6 or 7%. Um, so we think that's a, a something significant, certainly warrants research by the industry to, to justify um, which models are being chosen to, 
to do yield calculations. Um, so to wrap up, I'll, I'll thank you and offer you all um, free trial. Uh, it's the extended free trial of, uh, of SunSol yield. So thank you.